What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. Today, we have a very disturbing, chilling case about an individual named Nicholas Browning. 15-year-old Delaney High School student is arrested and charged as an adult in the murders of his family. Nick Wagoner Browning was born on February 9, 1992. He was known as the Golden Boy. On paper, he was an honor student, he had a group of good friends, and was involved in sports. The crime scene they found inside was so disturbing that even the veteran officers could barely believe the horrors that they witnessed. 10905 Powers Avenue had become the scene of an absolute bloodbath. You haven't shed one tear for your family. I mean, do you want people to look at you as a cold-blooded killer? 1,300 people showed up to pay their respects to the Browning family. What is justice for the Browning family? The horrific tragedy of the Browning family will never be forgotten. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. Yo, what's up? What's up, man? And my producer, Daniel. What's going on, man? How's it going, everybody? Today, we have a very disturbing, chilling case about an individual named Nicholas Browning. And what makes this case so disturbing is the fact that he was only 15 years old when he brutally murdered his entire family. And questions are still out there today as to why he did this, because it really just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But one of the things that's even more eerie about this case is that recently, just back in February of this year, so police responded to a man in distress call at the Browning residence and a man by the name David Emery Linthicum who was 24 years old, actually shot multiple Baltimore County police officers and then went on the run for 39 hours. And luckily they ended up catching him and the officers ended up surviving their injuries. But it's just very weird that in the same month that this happened back in 2008, the, the Browning family massacre, obviously there's no connections necessarily. I just think it's something to mention because happened the same month and at the same location. So I don't know. There's just something off about this one. Yeah. I can't put my my finger on it. But Did they ever figure out why that guy? I don't the, think the so. The most recent one? I don't think so. And I mean, they or they haven't released it yet because this is an ongoing case. And, you know, they're probably still investigating the reasons for why he, David, did what he did. But it will be interesting to see what happens with David and kind of more of the context behind his incident as more information comes out is still a developing story. And so we don't really know all the details, but I just thought it was interesting to mention this incident with David Linton come from this year, because again, it happens in the exact same location that the Browning family massacre did. Again, this area is a pretty safe, know normal neighborhood situation and so it's just wild that something so violent happened yet again so the exact location that both of these incidents took place in is cockiesville maryland which is an affluent suburb about 20 minutes north of baltimore city center the neighborhoods on the northeast side of town are filled with wooded streets and large houses and many paved roads dead end at small forested creeks or offshoots of the lock raven reservoir it's an isolated area, again, with big lots, big houses where families settle down for a quiet life to raise kids. And this was true for the Browning family, who lived in a large, beautiful farm-style house with a wraparound porch at 10905 Powers Avenue. They were known as the friendly family and active members of their community. The father, John Browning, who's 45 years old, was a successful local attorney working for Royston, Mueller, McLean, and Reed over in Towson, Maryland. He was a local church leader and the scoutmaster for his son's Boy Scout troop, Troop 328. His wife, Tamara, who was 44, was a stay-at-home mom with a property management side business. And their oldest son was none other than 15-year-old Nicholas, who went by Nick. 
His two younger brothers were Gregory, who was 14 years old at the time, and Benjamin, who was 11. They were seen as the all-American family. They never struggled with money problems, and all their sons excelled in their studies. A close neighbor, Mike Thomas, said that they would do anything in the world to help someone else, and they even went along the street and picked up trash in their free time. But the Browning family's life would take a turn for the worst, when their oldest son suddenly felt the drive of a demon inside of him. Nick Wagoner Browning was born on February 9, 1992. He was known as the Golden Boy. He was a sophomore and an honor student at Delaney High School. He was on the varsity lacrosse team. He played golf. He skied. And he was on his way to making Eagle Scout. Which, Austin, you're an Eagle Scout, aren't you? Yes, I am. You know how rigorous and tough that is, huh? Yeah, and there's a lot of stress involved. Yeah, it's a big project. A classmate once called him a typical Baltimore teenager who was cocky and from a wealthy family. But Nick wasn't exactly who he seemed on the surface. His friend John Lockwood noticed something was off about Nick as time went on. John later described Nick as a spoiled kid who mocked minorities and disabled people. At school, Nick began complaining about his father constantly. It even got to the point where he would talk about killing his whole family one day, but he would laugh it off as a joke. His friends knew Nick liked dark jokes to get a rise out of people, so they didn't think he was serious. Other students who rode the bus with Nick also began noticing his morbid jokes and Nick wasn't afraid to let everyone know what he was thinking. One of the middle schoolers overheard Nick talking about how his dad would always yell at him, and he also had a lot of money, so if he killed him, he would get some of that money for himself. His friend John also noticed how Nick got away with everything at home. He would beat up his younger brother, steal from his parents' liquor cabinet, and steal his parents' cars for a joyride before he even had his driving permit. His parents tried to control Nick, but it was no use. He was going to keep doing whatever he wanted to do, and he wasn't going to let his family get in the way of that. So that leads us to February 1st, 2008, which seemed like a normal Friday. School was out for the weekend, and John drove his son Nick over to Ryan Fingal's house that evening for a sleepover. Before leaving, John checked to see if Ryan's parents were home, which they were, so he headed back home. Nick and his friends played some lacrosse, watched movies, and stayed up late. But after watching some movies late that night, Nick suddenly left the sleepover at around 12.45 a.m., he told the others that he's going to go steal his parents' Ford Expedition so that they could go out for a joyride. It was a week out from his 16th birthday, which was on February 9th, and he was convinced he would get the Expedition as a sweet 16 birthday gift from his parents anyway. The rest of his friends saw him leave, but he ended up being gone for several hours. After walking home in the early morning hours of February 2nd, the rest of his family was asleep when he got back to his house on Powers Avenue. Nick snuck through an open door in the parents' basement where he had seen his father cleaning his 9mm pistol earlier in the day. He then put on his father's gloves, picked up the pistol and a spare magazine, and walked upstairs. He found his father sleeping peacefully on the living room couch. Nick stood and watched him for what he thought was half an hour. He then raised the pistol and shot his father in the head, killing him instantly. For a moment, he thought the gunfire would wake up the rest of his family, so he waited next to his dead father for the rest of them to come downstairs. When they never showed up, he went up to the second floor bedrooms. First, he found his mother and shot her twice as she lay in her bed. Then he opened her jewelry box and scattered a few of her bracelets and necklaces on the floor. After poorly staging a robbery, it seems, he continued down the hall to his brother's bedrooms. He aimed and shot Gregory once in the head. Across the room, Benjamin began to stir, so Nick raised the gun again and shot Benjamin twice in the head. One of the bullets grazed Benjamin's left index finger after he raised his hands up to cover his face. He might have been the only one who realized what was happening for a split second. Nick then headed back to Ryan Fingal's house as if nothing happened. One of his friends, Alex, had fallen asleep soon after Nick left the sleepover. He woke up around 5 a.m. and noticed that Nick was still gone, meaning he had been gone for over four hours, so he gave him a call. Nick lied and said he had gotten lost, but he was on his way back to Ryan's house. When he returned without the expedition, his friends were wondering why. He just said, you know, I went there, got in, fell asleep in the unlocked expedition, but never got the keys. And then they all went back to bed. The next morning, Nick's mom was supposed to pick him up around 9 a.m. to do family chores and clean up the house, but she never showed up. So instead, Nick and his friends headed to the mall to play arcade games and hang out for the day. He also made a few phone calls to his home in Cockeysville and the family's vacation home at Deep Creek Lake. In the voice messages, he told his family that he loved them and that he would see them soon. 
At some point during the day, his friend Alex saw that Nick had the keys to the Ford Expedition in his coat pocket the whole time, so he began to think something was off. When they are all done with the mall, Alex's dad, Patrick Smith, picked them up. Patrick acted as the chauffeur for the day and drove them over to Nick's house on Powers Avenue so Nick could check in with his family. But really, he just wanted to stage a discovery of the murders. Patrick waited outside in the car while Nick and a friend headed into the house through the garage door. A few minutes later, Patrick watched Nick come outside with a look of absolute horror on his face. He said he had just found his dad's lifeless body with blood draining from his nose on the first floor. Patrick Smith then cut the engine to the car and went inside the home. He found John covered in blood on the couch and immediately called 911. When the dispatcher mentioned performing CPR on John, Patrick said it was far too late for that. John was clearly dead, and Patrick was afraid of disturbing the body. Meanwhile, Nick and Ryan went up to the second floor to check things out. When they returned to Patrick, Nick said he had also found the rest of his family in their beds, all covered in blood. Emergency responders arrived at the home around 5 p.m. The crime scene they found inside was so disturbing that even the veteran officers could barely believe the horrors that they witnessed. 10905 Powers Avenue had become the scene of an absolute bloodbath. Nick's mother, father, and two brothers were all found deceased. John Browning was found on the living room couch lying on his side with his head on a pillow. He was covered by a blanket like he had been sleeping, and he was surrounded by a bowl of popcorn and some books. A bullet wound was found in his head. Tamara was found upstairs in her bedroom, blood spattered the wall behind her, and she was covered up to her neck in blankets. Two bullet casings were found beside her. Across the room, officers noticed her jewelry box had been opened, and a few pieces of jewelry were found scattered on the floor. The two youngest sons, Gregory and Benjamin, were also found shot to death in their shared bedroom. Each was found covered in blood, lifeless lying in their separate twin beds. When Baltimore County investigators searched the house for clues, they noticed the basement sliding glass door had been left unlocked and slightly opened. There were small signs of a break-in, but all the windows and doors were intact, and besides the open jewelry box and a few shuffled items, there were no other signs of a robbery. Meanwhile, Nick was outside leaning against a pickup truck. He stared at the ground, never lifting his head. That evening, police took Nick and the three other sleepover friends into the station for questioning, and they placed each of them into separate interrogation rooms. Since Nick was still a minor with no priors, the detective read them their rights and jumped into the interrogations before anyone could request an attorney. After questioning Nick's friends, they all slowly revealed lies and inconsistencies with Nick's story. They found out he had trouble at home, often called his dad Hitler, had lied about not having the car keys, and had ordered his brother Gregory to keep the basement door open on the night of the murders. The officers went with the motive that Nick had a rough time at home and his relationship with his father ultimately led him to murder his entire family. And after the friends were allowed to leave the station, the interrogators doubled down on Nick. Here's some of the absolutely bizarre interrogation clips from that night. And then at around 1.30, stupid me, I went back to my house to try and get the car. You know? <laughs> and they announced the keys were um, where my parents were, uh, the lights were on in the house. And so I didn't want to take the car out. So because the lights were on, you know, I was sort of worried. And so I went in the car and sort of, you know, they'll go to, they'll go to bed in a half hour and the lights will be off. So I was sitting there and I fall asleep. Then I get a call from Alex around, I think, five in the morning. Okay. And then I wake, he wakes me up and then, you know, I flip the car and the lights are still on in the house. Okay. You know, it doesn't make sense now, but. Okay. You know, so what do you do that? I walk back home. Okay. It's like, yes, yes, it's five in the morning. Okay. So did you ever get inside the keys at all, or? No, I was on that car, but never inside the house. Okay, okay. You, you, did, did you walk back to Ryan's house then? That, and okay. I got that hard, then. It's, it's a hike, it's probably yeah. like 20 minute walk, so. Okay. So a couple, couple things there. He's obviously talking about, talking to the detective about the events of that night, and when he, when he went back to his house, and he says he never went inside the house, and that he just went into the, you know, unlocked expedition and sat in there because the lights were still on in the house and obviously he was going to wait for them, his parents to go to bed before he went in. But the first thing that really stood out to me when watching his interrogation footage is just his demeanor. For somebody who had just killed his entire family, there's absolutely no emotion there whatsoever. Nothing. He's so calm and collected. 
and we've talked about this before where it's does emotion reveal anything or is there you know people process trauma in different ways so it's should he be like bawling his eyes out or how how do people actually respond to things like this but there is something cold and chilling about the way he's acting thank you to rocket money for sponsoring today's episode Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance app that I use pretty much every single day and has really changed the game when it comes to managing my finances and keeping track of all my transactions that I make as well as my subscriptions. I've actually been a member of Rocket Money for the last couple of years and I couldn't imagine it any other way. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. These days, it seems like everything has a subscription, especially those streaming services, which oftentimes when you sign up for them, you're taking advantage of that free trial, but then you forget to cancel it. And then before you know it, you're spending hundreds of dollars throughout the year on services you're not using anymore. The thing I love about Rocket Money is that it's so much more than just managing your subscriptions. Again, you can track your credit. You can do autopilot savings where you're putting money into a different account. There's a way to check your credit scores, budgeting, and even your net worth. It's really nice to just get a snapshot of your financial situation at any time by going to their app. And with over 3 million users and counting, Rocket Money customers have saved an average of $720 a year. The app is free to download, free to try, and you can get a good feel for it. And I highly recommend becoming a member. It will save you money in the long run because on average, most customers of Rocket Money have saved an average of $720 a year. That's more money in your pocket. So stop wasting money on things you don't use and cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Check it out today at rocketmoney.com slash lights out. The other thing too is that he's clearly a very intelligent individual for especially for only being 15 years old. And what you'll notice when watching these clips is that he thinks that he's going to be able to fool this police detective into believing his story. And one of the, the little things that he says is stupid me, you know, stupid me. I thought it was a good idea to go, you know, steal my parents' car to the detective to kind of give him the idea that, you know, I'm this, I'm this good kid. I know that that was a bad thing to do. Yeah. And he's really trying to downplay everything that just happened and and convince the detective that he is not capable of killing his family so therefore this must have been a robbery this right. must have been intruders that came in and ultimately they killed their family well thing about that is typically and i think the statistics show that burglars typically don't kill people when no. when they burglarize a house they usually don't do it when people are home for that very reason they don't want to put themselves in that situation yeah. does it happen yes but typically it doesn't happen and yeah, typically super rare like in cold blood truman capote that's about how it was like a robbery but turns into this crazy murder sequence same with we cheshire murders was another case where it was like what well, it was maybe supposed to just be a murder but right. can't really figure it out but yeah for the most part no no one's out to murder anyone they're just down to get a few hundred bucks of worth of property and especially kids too right yeah like sleeping kids in their beds why would you do that why would, would you make no sense it doesn't make any sense and obviously at this point like going into this interview police are very aware that this was not a robbery i mean it's it's very difficult to stage a, a robbery or a burglary and so there was no signs of forced entry you know stuff wasn't even stolen there was nothing missing from the house so they knew right away that his story is complete bullshit, but they're trying to work with him to make him feel comfortable. And they kind of take the good cop approach for most of the interview, uh, as, as we'll see going farther into this, that that changes ultimately at the end. But they're trying to kind of build a rapport with him to make him feel comfortable to hopefully end up getting a confession from him. Yeah. And uh, just to preface this, they're also kind of, in the meantime, they're bouncing back and forth between interviewing his friends around the same time up until a certain point. But they're trying to corroborate everyone's story, and they whiff a lot of bullshit throughout talking to the friends as well. Yeah, good point. Let's continue. 
you really got me. And in the course of this, I've been calling my parents all day and they haven't been done, yeah. so. From the cell phone? So, well, originally from Ryan's house phone and then my phone a bunch of times. Okay, okay. Um, so you guys get to back home. What happened then? Then I opened the garage door. I walk inside. How do you open the garage door? How do you do that? That's a code. Is there, oh, okay. For the outdoor, outdoor code. Right. 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 Garage door opens right. or something. Okay. And so I walked inside. Um, and then the door is unlocked, which is weird because one of my parents locked the door. Which door? The, the door and the... We're in the garage. Kitchen? In the from, kitchen. Okay, from the garage. Yeah. That was locked. So I figured it would be locked, but it wasn't. So I walked in. Okay. And I saw my father on the couch. And that's... Sort of what did you say about that? I know it's thoughtful. What did you say? I saw um, he was on the couch. He was, um, on, on the so somehow he has an appetite after everything that just transpired. And he even laughs a little bit, which is just chilling to watch. And the police officer kind of plays into this kind of cool guy thing. Yeah. He's like kind of joking. We only eat junk food here. and But yeah, I don't know. Regardless of the emotional disposition he has, it's disturbing that he's ready to eat some food. Yeah. When you got home with Mr. Smith, right? You went upstairs, then you guys went outside, apparently. Right, went outside. Where did you go? Went out to the back, and then that door was unlocked. It was unlocked. It was unlocked the basement side door. Is that characteristically locked also, or do they always... Seventy-five. That's that's not because that's sort of from what they did see in their basements. So that's probably okay. more or less. That's not locked as often. Okay. Okay. Man, if you had to make a guess, how someone got in the house, how would you? When did you see your parent flap or talk to your parent? When did you see your parent flap like that? And then he got me off at Argentino's house. So decided that Greg was in the parents. In the car with your parents when you dropped you off? the car and then stayed at the house. Okay. You got dropped over at Ryan's house. Okay. Did you talk to my phone at all that night? The plan was they were going to pick you up at, I think, 9 o'clock the next morning. Okay. What was that? You guys had something to do or? Just uh, clean the house, actually. Yeah. Okay. Did you talk to your brothers at all? No. All right. Okay. Um, what time did you start calling the house? This is our first call. I think we called because the kids would come over tonight and it was like, well, let them get together. And right. I called it about 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, this, this morning? This morning. Okay. I house then. And I called their cell where I called all the numbers. Break cell, my mom's cell, dad's cell, or even our deep freak house. Oh, okay. kind of wing. Did they try to call you at all last night? Nothing? 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 nothing. 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 You missed her or messaged her? Yeah, is there a text on yours? Any, yes, text, any text from them or whatever? Nothing from them. Okay. Um, I noticed that there's the, we're being told there's a gun locker in the house, in the base basement. What kind of guns your dad have? Two pistol, a 40 caliber, nine millimeter, a little. Do you know what kind of one? I mean, do you know guns at all? Yeah, little Smith and Webb, two both of pistol, I think. One was a gift from our uncle. Mm -hmm. It's the pistol they use on the Boeing 747 things. Okay. So one of those, and then 30 S6 rifle, a couple shotguns. You guys hunt at all, or just he hunts? I find a couple times more like pigeons. We shoot those up deep here. Okay. So pistol wise, nine millimeter, forty caliber. Is it something thirty eight special? Is it a revolver? I mean, it's different. Is it? It's a revolver. It's a like a two inch barrel. I mean, it's just World War Two old old pistol. Okay. I'm not sure what that takes. I was told there's two lockers, is that true? There, yes, there's the rifle case and then there's the ammo slash uh, pistol case thing. Okay. So it's two different cabins, I take it? Yes. Is? Okay. Okay. And I asked before, do we know where the keys are to the... But you don't have an actual set that you can get to us to... Um, if I if I did get maybe his dressers next to this, um but you, you don't have anything no, that I know. Okay. Uh, my only comment is that interesting. He's is he 15 at this point? I mm -hmm. think interesting. He knows his dad's armory down to the ammunition and the Caliber. models. Yeah. Like my, I don't know about you. My dad had some firearms in the hospital growing up. He wouldn't even, I didn't even know where they were. I didn't know what he had. He kept them on lock. So that was I mean, really he did say that he shoots clay pigeons up at their their vacation home, and he's in Boy Scouts, which you know, 
sometimes firearms are associated with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I think the reason for this question by police is to try, I mean, it's great evidence for them to use that Nick knew about these, you know, firearms. Plus it establishes the, the murder weapon was a nine millimeter and he specifically knows that there's a nine millimeter in there. And so he, he's, he's working on, again, building that rapport with Nick, but at the same time, he's, it's not necessarily proving any guilt when it comes to the crime at hand, but it is showing that he was at least familiar with the guns in the house, where they were, how to get to them. And so is it possible that he was able to access that nine millimeter that night? Right. It's a good point. You said you had a good relationship with your dad. Was he hard on you at all or anything like that? Like, but I mean, yeah, we've had our issues, but yeah. your friend ratted, ratted you out. said you got caught drinking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what happened there? Um, there was actually twice. One time I got caught at a friend's house, and then there was a ski trip. This was actually about a month ago. Yeah. You know, ski trip up to Vermont, and I stupidly brought some stuff, and you know, they found it, and you know. Your parents were on a ski trip with you? No, they uh, found it in my bag before we left. Okay. So, Brian or someone told me that you called home to talk to Greg at one point last night. Called him around. I called him. I walked around, spent like nine, ten. Okay. What did you tell him? Hold on. Don't leave the back door on that. Why did you tell him to do that? I was going to go into the house and grab the key. Okay. I'm not trying to hit on you for driving a car. I don't know. It's just. It was. All right. We'll get you for some food here for you. Where are my friends? Bye bye. Do they go home? My oh, parents got them. We have to have the parents come get them. Okay, so you're it? Yep. Oh, I'm tired. I'm going to hop a long time. I'm going to hop a saw. It's been here a while. <laughs> Stuff's just not adding up for me right now. With you. Okay. Yeah. Tell me why your dad was so pissed at you yesterday. I'm mad at oh, your friends are saying that your father was uncharacteristically just dis- living dis- with you. Yes, sir. Well, I mean, I see what he, obviously the parents are having it. But anyway, I'm uh, What now? Yes, yeah, so he, when he, he dropped me off Thingle's house, he mm-hmm. went to the door and made sure the parents were out. Okay. But everybody's saying that he was just, he was ticked off. What was he mad about? What was he mad about? Is there a reason he would say that? What? Is there a reason that they would say something like that? Um, he's not. It's not really nice though, I don't think. That's uh, not. <clears throat> they said it was uncharacteristic for him that usually when he does see them, he's always pleasant. That's why this particular moment stood out to them. Well, I mean, they didn't see another. There was one person, Spangles, Brian okay. Jones, saw them. So I'm okay. not sure what they're basing their experience. I'm, I'm just no, uh, what they're I'm, saying. They just didn't see him except for Ryan. Okay. So mm-hmm. you're saying he wasn't upset? Yeah. And even if he was, they wouldn't have seen him. You know? okay. It all would have come through me, what they. Hmm. So. All right. But things aren't, aren't ending up here. I, I, I don't understand. Some things that happened here tonight. Um, I think you had something to do with what happened tonight. I think that you killed your family. And the thing is, the more you lie, the deeper it gets. There's got to be a reason why you did this. This, your family. We need to know what happened here. It's not fun. Look at this. There are happier times. Nobody broke into the house last night. No. Yeah, it had to be you. Nobody else did this. You know where we found the keys for the gun lockers? Where? You tell me. You know where they are. We searched them out? Yeah, you do. They're under your mattress. In your room. On the right side of the bed. You put them there. Nobody broke into the house. You went in that house. You called and had your brother leave the door open. There's no other explanation. Yes, you did. And the more you lie, the deeper it's going to get for you. You're 15 years old. You really do still have a life ahead of you. But the more you lie, the deeper it gets for you. I mean, do you want people to look at you as a cold-blooded killer? Or somebody that just made a mistake? Nobody else did it. Tell me how the key is that on your mattress. Nobody broke into your house. You killed your family. The only gun missing is a nine millimeter. Why? 
Was it your father? I didn't kill him. He did. He killed your family. Why did you call your father Adolf Hitler? That's our, he's, he's straight. And that's our whole, that's a, it's a joke. My mom called him Hitler Force. How else could this happen other than you? It was. And saying no, it wasn't, isn't going to make me go away. Right now, you're a man. You, you've got to mess up to this. I couldn't. You did do it. As we speak, we're developing more and more evidence that you did this. There's no other explanation for what. There's no other explanation for what we're finding other than that you did it. What it means is that I did it. You'll see. You'll see. Yes, you did. You lied to us. You lied to us about contacting your brother. You lied to us about the I never mean, lied to us. I had my brother. I told you that. You only told me after I pointed out to you that you did it. I didn't. And the keys, the keys to the gun locker are in your bed, or under your bed. There's no other explanation. Nobody broke into this house. It was you. You left your friends. What happened? Why? Explain to us why that would have happened. There's no reason for me to kill my love. They provide me everything I want. It's just chilling to watch him sit there. They're showing him pictures of his family mm -hmm. and he's just stone cold you could tell his confidence has faded a little bit definitely he's still just denying denying the cops clearly have changed tactics here and they're starting to go a lot harder they've brought in another detective to kind of put the pressure on him to you know and also just poking holes in his entire story his lies that he's been telling them and they're kind of flipping the tables on him and yeah, like you said, I think they're starting to to break him down internally. And I think he's starting to realize that I'm not going to be able to get out of this. Yep. They said that it was straight. That's not a reason to kill somebody. We talk to people every day who love their wives, love their children, love their babies, love their friends. And they sit right where you're sitting. They love them too. But things happen. We're human beings. Things upset people. And they... This is one of the ways that they act out. And it was probably something that just, it happened just like that. It happens that fast. Help us explain it. And somebody Help us be able to explain to the family what happened here. Convince me you didn't do it. What if, if I did it, why would I leave the key? You know, if I just, if I was, if I planned, you know, I killed my family, why would I leave the keys underneath my mattress? Because that's where you put them. I never thought we'd find them. If, you, you didn't know we were there, sir. We, we're turning our house upside down. We're finding things. Cell phones, all kinds of stuff. It's not the end of the world, but if you're going to sit here and lie, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem. Listen, again, people sit in that chair every day and say the same things that you're saying. And believe me, when they're done, they feel much better. We wouldn't be sitting here talking to you like we are if we didn't think we did it. No. I know your friends didn't do it. I know nobody broke into that house last night. I didn't need the back doors open. Still, it's breaking in. Nobody did that. Your parents were supposed to come get you at 9 o'clock this morning. You don't bother going home to check on them all day. You knew you were supposed to go home and clean the house. Instead, you go to the mall. You knew you didn't have to. Not to why. Go home. And I was in my room all day at the mall. No, I could stay in the house. So I absolutely didn't want to do that. So I thought I called them, left messages, and they couldn't be mad at me. Why didn't you just walk in? So I didn't want to stay in the house. Doesn't make sense. Why not? Because your parents are strict. Right? And you, know what you, you know what you were supposed to do. And you, my parents, but I, I still make mistakes. That's not a mistake. No, no, not the... the 
I mean, there's fruit, but they're not, they're not that fruit. For example, so uh, three weekends ago, the alcohol that I told, that, told you about, mm -hmm. I wasn't grounded for that. Obviously, I wasn't. I was at a friend's house two weekends later. I mean, they can be strict, but they're not, you know. Then why did it happen? You did. Yeah, we know you did. No. You've been doing this a long time, Tom. What? And the police are still at your house. Everything points to you. Everything. What? What? Points to you. The only thing you discharge the keys, I don't, I don't think I can put them there. Listen, if I, if I put somebody breaks into a house, okay, they're not going to go in the bedroom and throw keys under the mattress. No, I, I'm not saying that. My, the gun, the pistol was out. They you put, you put the keys there. Where was the gun? Where was the gun then? It was in the workshop, work room. It was way out with cleaning the gun. Where's the gun now? Not going there. Where's the gun now? That's another issue. There's a gun out there. <clears throat> Someone else could get hurt by this gun and it's going to fall on you. I like that last tactic. There's a gun out there and more could happen and you'll be more screwed than you are now. I yeah. think that's a good way. And they pressure. just caught him up with this, this, the other lie that, you know, oh, my parents are, are so strict and yet he goes back on that. And is like, oh, actually, they're not that strict. Right, yeah. I was well, at my friend's house it? two weekends later after I got busted with alcohol. Right, so is he Hitler or is he not? Right, you know? yeah. it's just like it, nothing makes sense here. And yeah. Honestly, the detectives in this case do an excellent job uh, of interrogating him in a way that in some cases they're just like brutal on you and kind of like force it out of you, but they really are patient. They take their time to to try and, you know, poke holes in a story. They they pump them up and then, you know, they they kind of circle around and come back to different things and they approach it in different ways and and now they're they're telling him they're like there's just no way that anybody broke into this house you know why why would the keys be under your mattress yeah and i also like the one guy at the edge of the table he's like it's not the end of the world but if you're going to sit here and lie you're just making it worse for yourself almost as like a little sympathetic as in like you can still come out of this okay not really but at least he's trying to sell him that idea right if you're a fan of Lights Out, you're probably a fan of the horror genre in general. And today I've got a new podcast I want to tell you about that I think will be right up your alley. This podcast is hosted by Eli Roth from the Travel Channel. He's also the director of horror films like Hostel, Cabin Fever, The Green Inferno, Knock Knock, and he's also a host of two other horror podcasts. But today I want to tell you about On a Ghost Ruined My Life with Eli Roth from Travel Channel. Hear the real life stories of people who have been through terrifying confrontations with the unknown and come out alive. For this podcast, Roth has gone through hundreds of submissions from real people whose lives have been ravaged by a ghost, demon, or sinister entity. Each episode focuses on one person's story, handpicked and introduced by Roth, and retold by the victims themselves. They talk about some of the most terrifying, unexplained events they've experienced, and now you can listen to a new season of all new real life stories of terror on a ghost ruined my life i highly recommend you listen to a ghost ruined my life with Elar roth wherever you get your podcasts the thing that doesn't make sense to me either is if his dad was cleaning his pistol i have a hard time believing his dad would just leave it out in I, and i don't know if the workshop in the basement or whatever could be locked and maybe it was out in the locked workshop or but either way, I just feel like if you have kids and you're a responsible gun owner, you're going to put that firearm back into its locker and yeah, lock it up. I think that is one of the big questions of this case is, was he a responsible gun owner? I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we don't yeah. know for sure. But then again, Nick knew where the gun keys were. He knew how to get into the locker. So is that just a flat out lie? Right. You asked me where my parents' bedroom was. You kind of shed one tear for your family. You were totally unemotional about this. You walk into my house, your whole family's murdered. Seriously? And you I didn't do it. Why would I do it? So, so, I was in my friend's so house. Cry, so crying would make you believe. So crying, crying would make you believe. I think you're trying to convince yourself. You're doing a terrible job of convincing me. I think I 
Yeah, you do. Believe it or not, you do. You've defrauded me from my I couldn't. You did this. There's no doubt in my mind. No doubt in my mind. Bring me this. Okay. Well, you know what? You're under arrest. Okay. Four times I hurt you, Romano. Sit up. Sit up. The other cops like pissed. He's just like sick of hearing this dude this. lie. Yeah. The cop that's sitting closest to him is definitely the more patient one. And maybe that's just their tactic is like one is harder on him and the other one is kind of trying to be buddy buddy with him. Yeah. But also interesting to note that they were ready to arrest him and charge him before they even went in there. They were just trying to coax a confession. Yeah, they're trying to get a confession. And now this tactic is like now let's try to scare him. Yeah. And really let reality set in that you're going going to jail for this like um only people that can lay here and sleep are the guilty oh yeah you fell asleep for like 40 minutes or something you shed a tear. They left the room yeah. that's why i think there may not have been a reason maybe you are a stone cold pillar they show no emotion it's no emotion that that condemns me it's going goes a long way Emotions, people, people play with their emotions, they put them down. You know, it's... Some things are uncontrollable. The people who have set stories in their head act like this. People that have maybe almost convinced themselves they didn't do this. I know you don't believe it, but we see this every single day. I know the guilty by the way they act. Not even talk about the evidence. I'm just about the way you're acting tonight. Jerry won't. <laughs> the jury will. The jury will see this. What, you, you don't. There's no. There's no lesser punishment you're offering. You're saying come with the reason. It's an admission of guilt, right there. Yeah. Maybe you're insane. You two are in a mental hospital. I should. Well, he wants to go to a mental. I'm saying that there are explanations out there that can mitigate your life. What's going to happen to you? I don't know what your explanation is. There are reasons why people do things. There are heat of the moment. There are passion. It's all word for word. What's passion? What, it's still the same outcome. It may not be. I can't promise you anything. Right. So what's wrong from us? If, if I if I admit to it, I say I did it, and I say, oh, but you know, but why? It, but I'm looking for. I don't. I don't want you to say I did. I want to know why. There's no why. I didn't do it. But there's, they don't hit they me. They don't do anything. And that makes it worse for us. Because there's no explanation. You're getting charged with this tonight. There's no, no, there's no doubts about this. But I'm hoping that there's a reason. A reason that we can explain to the court, to the state's attorney. Here's why he said he did it. You know there are lesser charges, right? You know there's manslaughter. You're a smart kid. You know there's second degree murder. You know all this, but I don't know why things happen. The only thing I have right now is four dead people. My only recourse right now is first degree murder. If there's a mitigating factor, I would love to know this. Maybe that could affect the outcome in the rest of your life. I'm not here to bullshit you. You may think that. That's fine. But you're trying to bullshit me. I, it doesn't seem which are the to pull just saying it and say some reason doesn't seem to be very compelling because I'm still going to jail regardless. But if I take it to court, I'm worried about the Wow, that's a heck of a gamble, isn't it? But the rest of your life is a heck of a gamble. But, the rest, but as opposed to what? It's not to a lesser amount of time. A lesser amount of time, but it, it's still thirty it's, years. That's my life. But what if it's not? What if it's a mitigating factor strong enough? There's no mitigating factor. See, there is. So you're trying to play it in your head. I know you. I know what you're doing here. I know, maybe not know you, but I know the type of person because I've seen the person here in the same exact seat before. There's no mitigating factor. You want someone to come here and promise you because I was mentally abused, that's why I did this. I'm only gonna give you five years. That's what you want, right? 
that's what you want. But I can't give it to you right now. I can't say that. But I can certainly take what you tell me and give it to the right people. This is it. After this, there's no more me. There's no more mouthpiece for you right now. This ends when I leave. I could. Just, you're a good kid. I, I, I'm. I'm, oh, I'm, re, I'm reaching this. I'm, I'm trying to get there. Um. I can tell you care. That's just it. I can tell you care. I can tell you feel what you did. You see, this is the first time. The first genuine emotion I've seen all night is coming now. What happened? Nick, what happened? How'd he tell you to this? Because you're a father? Yeah, it was a it was a um this fraud. Yeah. Um but why? Was it physical? No. It's more sort of like a Last, um, probably still. I mean, it wasn't. It was. It was a little physical. Um, um, I'm, I'm in a uh, Boy Scouts, right? Mm -hmm. Right now. Uh, oh, it's okay, man. So there's this. Um, I'm almost to eagle. Very done. Almost done. You just get life, right? Life stuff. And then there's this uh, leadership weekend, camp out, whatever thing, and we're on we this uh, brown Z somewhere up in mm -hmm. Africa. But, um, anyways, I didn't want to go, you know, I'm almost done. I didn't need a leadership camp, to, so my attitude wasn't going on the trip. He got pissed. So he got pissed, and then he started coming out. Yeah, it's making a... Was he beating on you too, and mentally, or? It was mentally, and it was he got me a times. And that was for, that was the you're at life too, I know. You're at life scale for God's sakes. Oh, so that was for the beginning. Yeah, for the beginning of it. It's just how long ago was that? That was on um, this fall. Okay. Last fall. And then uh, you kept it up there. It just it kept going and the little thing just seemed you know, always reverted back to that one thing and then, you know. <laughs> the alcohol thing happened, then they called me and they found the car. Oh, you got called before. Yeah. He tried to keep it away from you. Right. So, but the whole time your grades are good. Everything um, else is great. Kids were good. And last year, last freshman year, I got a D one quarter, but then I got an A the next quarter, so I got a D well. So I'm not great. He's harping on the D. Right. Yeah, on the D, and then. Do you buy this like mean, emotionally abusive father? I think there's probably some truth to that. Sounds like maybe he was, but I mean, abusive is a strong word to use. I think maybe he had high expectations. And when you're a teenager, I mean, I know from personal experience, I definitely had my fair share of quarrels with my father. And so I, I can understand where he's coming from, from that perspective. But again, it doesn't sound that bad or bad enough that like none of it makes sense for why it would push him to do what he did right. at all. Like there's just no justifica justification there. Like, yeah, everyone, like a lot of people have, yeah. their dad is tough with them sometimes. Right. And, and he's, I don't know. I don't know what John's headspace was, but you think about, dude, you killed your two younger brothers. What did they have to do with your father? Right. Yeah. Everything is just centered on his dad right now. Um, and then the other thing that he mentioned, Nick mentions in that, in that last clip is that, his father hit him. So that was like the first time he made made the allegation that his father physically abused him potentially. Um, but then again, earlier on, he kind of walked away from that. So it's it's very confusing. And obviously, there's no way to know what's what's true and what's not. But now he's finally been broken down to the point where he's starting to, to come clean about what he did. And, uh, and what's the... You, you said you, you just kind of stood there for a little bit before it all happened. At least a half hour of this. Just, just sitting, sitting there, sitting there sleeping. Looking at him, raising the door, looking at him, down, raising the door. Mm -hmm. 
and this creates more time. I don't know if I pulled it, I mean, I must have pulled the trigger, but I don't know if I was subconscious and I meant to do it or what it was yeah. anything wrong. It was, it was loud ringing. And I sat down on the couch and waited for it all to crash and down. And waiting for your mom and the brothers to come down? And I never did. And then I, I swear to God, walk up the stairs in the living room. Did you sleep in the sound? Did you lean on the bed or what? What? I walked up to that point. Is that twice? And then you walked your brother's room? And then sat Greg and then it's in the bed. That when you come in there, is it? It's at the, the estate studio. Mm-hmm. So I walked in. I don't know that. Kind of different. I think I think I got a place. I'm not saying it's what's going What did you do after that? What happened with the jewelry in the back I, I opened up the jewelry case, first name around, and then the Xbox located on the table. And then... How did you leave it to the back door? Or? The back door. And I just didn't go on the side of the road. Did you notice how many neighbors were turning lights on, or was anybody outside? Not too bad. Sorry, I was, I was so, I was just, I really, I would have noticed someone standing with him. Well, there might have been somebody, but. We'll see stuff, stuff will come out later. We'll see things. So what happens now? Well, we need to contact your grandfather. So we're just waiting. Here's it now. Um. What do you want us to tell your grandma or your aunt? I don't know, you know what, to, what I would say. Okay. Well, it's, it's, we have to take care of some of that stuff. Yeah. All right. Bathroom, I'm going to be out a couple minutes. Bathroom, water, um, candy, cookies. So there's something like that. Coke, Pepsi. Whatever. Coke, be great. Yeah, not too great, great. Thank you. Finally got a confession out of him. And it's really just not a lot of explanation for why he killed his mother, why he killed his brothers, other than the fact that maybe he thought that he'd be a witness to the crime or something and they would turn on him and potentially make it worse for him. But again, they were sleeping. And after he shot his father, nobody came downstairs. He could have left. He could have left. It's like, what? There's something more going on there. Like, what made him then go upstairs and murder his mother and his two younger brothers? I mean, that to me is just. It's mind boggling. It is mind boggling because it's like the motive to kill his father was there. He had a, you know, tumultuous relationship with him and obviously felt a certain type of way, but there's no mention of how he felt about his brothers other than they were annoying to him. Which whose little like, brothers aren't, right? That's a, I mean, that makes no sense in, in this context. And his mother, I mean, his mother, I don't think he had any quarrels with. So it's just like something snapped inside him and he just went, went ber- berserk. Yeah. And going forward, I mean, I'm sure everyone's wondering why. And that's a question that I don't know if will ever be answered, but investigations started to uncover a bit more things as they started to interview people. But going forward, they had to consider the charges and potential convictions against Nick, obviously. I mean, the evidence started stacking up, right? For first-degree murder and life imprisonment specifically, it usually has to be deliberate and premeditated with malice aforethought. And I know a lot of our veteran true crime listeners will probably know a lot about premeditation, but I was a little more curious. I dug a little bit more into it. Um, just after I got into true crime, obviously premeditation is a big factor into first degree murder. So I used to confuse when I was fresh, like maybe some of our listeners are, I used to confuse premeditation with planning, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Usually planning is a great indication of premeditation, but premeditation really only means you have some level of forethought about the crime before committing it. This could mean years, and this could even mean just a few seconds of consideration. Determining that is hard. 
to say like, oh, he thought about it a few seconds beforehand, which is why there's heat of passion murders, right? Where people just snap, they go into a blind rage and they didn't consider it beforehand. In addition to premeditation though, the murderer must also have malice, which is a desire to kill along with deliberation, meaning that the murderer was fully aware that his or her actions would lead to death or serious injury. And proof of malice could be something as simple as obviously he's using a deadly weapon in this scenario, you know, and shooting your family members in the head. That's pretty. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty a kill shot. Indicator. So you know that that's going to result in death. Exactly. Um, but even within the first 24 hours of crime, there was still doubt of premeditation because I mean, there's all, there's just a lot of weird factors in this case. And, was he specifically going home to kill his family? We know that he told his brother to leave open the back door, but that honestly could have just been to go steal the keys to the car like he told his friends that he was going to do, right? But then you think, okay, if he had the keys and he was unlocking the gun safe to grab the gun, obviously isn't that premeditation there, you know, going for that? But I think it's very interesting that premeditation can happen, like, in a split second that's all you need yeah well i think you also have to consider the things that he said to his friends before the fact that he has ever uttered the words that i'd kill my entire family or right. my whole family um if that is indeed true i feel like that's a another good in indicator here that maybe this is something he had been thinking about maybe he never thought he would act on it and this night just happened to be the night where everything sort of came together and then in his something snapped in his mind he's like i'm doing this yeah because it's like for me to consider this in any other scenario other than first degree murder he was at his friend's house it wasn't like he was home interacting with his father and then you know they got into an argument or a dispute and he went and grabbed the gun and shot shot everybody he was at his friend's house and he left at a strategic time. I believe he the story of going to get the car was the cover story for the actual crime. It's, I mean, he is a very intelligent 15 year old. Yeah, it's very definitely. obvious by the way he speaks, by the way, I mean, even the investigators say it to him, you know, they're like, you're a smart kid. And they're, I'm sure they were impressed by the way he was, how long he was able to keep up, you know, kind of stonewalling them and, and kind of in the way that he answered their questions, he's very mature for his age. So I, I think this is very calculated, very planned out. And I mean, he went, he got the gun, he's standing in front of his father and he's, you know, bringing it up. And obviously he's potentially having second thoughts about what he's about to do, but ultimately he pulls the trigger. And then the way that he words everything throughout the entire interrogation seems to me that he's trying to once once he knows he's caught he's like okay now i'm going to make it seem like this was just a happen you know happens chance type of thing where oh the gun just went off the way he explains that oh it just went off type of thing it's like no you i guess i pulled the trigger and it's like i think he's just continuing to lie and continuing to try and protect himself no matter no matter what cuz he knows the what the punishment is and that was the thing too is before they even cracked him he already knew what the punishment for what he did was yeah and he was so, even talking about 30 years right, right. Like he years already knew life. so that tells me he's looked this up before he's probably looked up the different punishments for murder and so he's already well aware because he's already he's asking for lesser punishments and also mental hospital so in his head he's like he probably thought, which this happens a lot, people think if I commit a murder and then make myself seem crazy or like I had a psychotic episode during this, which he, he does a very poor job at doing, that perhaps I will get life in a mental institution. Which he mentioned, yeah. He which mentioned. people believe that's a better route to go. Mm -hmm. And from all the research I've done and stories I've heard, it's actually way worse than actually being in in prison i feel like in prison many, you many can cases. still have certain freedoms that you right. have in a in a mental he doesn't even understand so he thinks that perhaps by seeming crazy and like oh i was in you know this trance and stuff just happened that 
I'm going to ultimately get a lesser sentence. I'll go to a mental hospital and maybe even get out one day. And he's well aware of all this. It's very clear from the interrogation footage. Yeah, he definitely is trying to soften the blow. I still can't get over the fact that after he killed his dad, terrifying to think that a gunshot can go off in the house and no one's scrambling down to see what would, what would happen. Were they just in that deep of a sleep or maybe his brothers were too scared to get out of bed or something? I, yeah, my, my two thoughts on that are, A, it's a very large house. So mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't know the proximity of, they're on a different floor and they could be on one side of the house. The living room could be on the other side. And a nine millimeter is, is, is loud, but it's not all that loud. It's not as loud as some other firearms are. So that's true. It's, there is a good chance that you wouldn't hear it if you were sleeping because it's, you know, it's a loud pop. Yeah. And you know, it's his other brother did wake up True. when yeah, he went into his brother's end. room. Yeah. But and again, sometimes people sleep with fans and sleep with noise machines and things like that. So there could be white noise or something else that helps drown out the sound or they're just deep sleepers and they didn't hear it. That's true. I just, I can't get, get over the fact just going upstairs after killing his father. Cause you know, if we're going to believe him at the end of this interrogation, this confession that his dad was kind of the crux of his anxiety, his stress and everything. I just, you went upstairs, man. Like there's more to this story than you're willing to give us. And there was absolutely no reason for you to kill your brothers. So that was the biggest question going forward in this case was just to figure out why. Yeah. I mean, my, my thing, my thinking behind all this is if this was really about his dad, then he would have only killed his dad. Yep. And he would not have waited at the scene for his mother and his brothers to come downstairs. This, this was calculated, this was planned out. He, the plan was, if they don't come downstairs, I go upstairs and kill them for whatever reason. But had this just been about his dad and it happened to just be, you know, emotions were high and you know, this was a crime of passion, he would have shot his father, freaked out, and fled immediately after the gun accidentally went off or you know just happened to go off but that didn't happen and all signs point to that this was a planned out thing in my opinion yeah i'm a little lost on it but i i respect your opinion i also did want to say this interrogation footage was like 25 minutes this is like two hours worth and shout out to Explore with us. They, they did an in-depth review of this entire interrogation tape. It's very, very good. I highly recommend you go watch their video after this because it goes through everything. And they have, uh, I believe they have like psychologists and other licensed uh, mental health professionals that review and, and comment on it. That's why you saw some of the you know, text in there. Yeah, they also interviewed the friends and they gave yes, a little that's more detailed also, stuff. And which was strange because maybe there was some possible collusion going on with the friends at some point but they eventually broke them down but we'll link we'll link that for you if you want to check that out after after this episode but after nick's confession he jumped into a jail jumpsuit and he was officially charged with four counts of first degree murder and four handgun offenses so in the interrogation footage that we didn't show nick does eventually tell them where he dropped the gun into some bushes and in the early morning hours of February 3rd, police go out there and they find the pistol. And it ends up being a Smith & Wesson Model 639, which shoots 9mm rounds underneath a tree. It was a quarter mile from the Browning home, right where Nick told police he had left it. His father had bought the gun from a clerk at his law firm back in 2004. And he bought it because he was worried about Tamara going to the family lake house by herself without protection. And he had heard rumors that there were bears in the area. John also had a decent collection of guns in the family home, and when people looked into his past, the public was critical of John having guns in the house in the first place, especially out in the open with children in the house. Supposedly, when he was a child, his brother accidentally shot and killed their sister in the 1970s, and the local news quickly dove into the Browning family tragedy and the family's history. Here's a clip from the local news. 15-year-old Delaney High School student is arrested and charged as an adult in the murders of his family. 
This after a gruesome discovery inside a Baltimore County home. Police say the bodies of four people, a man, a woman and two boys were found after five yesterday afternoon at their home in the 10,000 block of Powers Avenue in Cockeysville. Tonight, community members have placed candles and flowers at the home of the victims as an expression of sorrow. Here's 11 News reporter Melissa Carlson with more on the police investigation. Neighbors watch as Baltimore County police scoured the Browning home. Police say just before 5 p.m. Saturday night, they received a 911 call from 15-year-old Nicholas Browning. He told police he has spent Friday night and Saturday at a friend's house. And when he came home, he found his father dead inside the residence. But hours later, his story changed. And just after 1 a.m., Nicholas was formally arrested. Early Sunday morning, he did indeed admit that he had killed him. He had been having some sort of disagreements with his father. Uh, and this was how he resolved them. Police say they arrived on scene and located all four members of the family inside the home. Nicholas's father and prominent real estate lawyer of the firm Royston, Mueller, McLean and Reed, 45-year-old John Browning, was found in a first-floor room. Nicholas's mother, Tamara, younger brother, 13-year-old Gregory, and 11-year-old Benjamin were all upstairs in their beds. Police say Nicholas admitted to using his father's gun and shot each family member in the upper body. After he shot them, he took it down to a nearby street around the corner, to, threw it in some bushes, and later told detectives where it was. This morning, detectives were still at the home. Neighbors we spoke to said the family had lived in this home for more than 12 years and described them as quiet but friendly and active members of the community. He was a scout leader. That used to have a whole bunch of canoes here, took kids out on canoes. And they were still in disbelief that this could happen in their neighborhood, but told us you really never know what goes on behind someone else's closed doors. Did you think there was any domestic problems? And they said, no, I didn't think so. And it's like, who would know anyway? Unfortunately, it may be the son, the older son. Nicholas Browning has already made an appearance in front of a court commissioner. Bail was denied. He's currently being charged with four counts of first degree murder. As you can imagine, this case quickly blew up, became a high profile murder case and infamous, really, especially in Maryland. Today's episode is sponsored by Every Plate. Every Plate is now owned by HelloFresh, a leading meal kit company. Honestly, I love Every Plate. Everything comes out portioned perfectly. I don't have to worry about going to the grocery store. And honestly, I love the meal options that they have. They're so delicious. I had this green chickpea and feta bowl. Honestly, I'm a sucker for feta cheese. I know so is Danny. And the other great part about it is that it's not that expensive compared to everything else. It's cheap. You get more bang for your bite with America's Best Value Meal Kit. Every plate is 25% cheaper than the grocery shopping with no hidden fees. So you can really count on that great value week after week, which I know I do. You can count on every plate to make meal times way easier without compromising on the quality. Every plate recipes include only the highest quality ingredients, including sustainably sourced seafood that meets the Monterey Bay Aquarium seafood rankings. So you know those meals will be fresh and flavorful. In an ever-changing world, you know every plate offsets 100% of their delivery emissions, and their meals have a 31% lower carbon footprint. You know, at this day and age, consumption, you have to be a little more conscious about what you're buying and what you're getting. And you know what? That makes me feel a little bit better every time I eat every plate. So get $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. As the media looked into every detail, Nick was placed in the care of a guardian since he was still a minor. And on February 5th, he was denied bail. His attorney, Steve Silverman, knew he had to be careful about everything he said going forward. The early stages of a high-profile murder case like this are very sensitive, especially in the local community. Steve claimed that Nick was traumatized by his family's deaths, and he also questioned how accurate Nick's confession really was. He then got another high-powered defense attorney. Joshua Treem was a former federal prosecutor, and he was famous for representing one of the DC snipers, 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo, back in 2002. One of Joshua's colleagues once said, quote, he fights like a dog for his clients. And if Nick was going to have any chance in court, he needed to have a good lawyer. But his case wouldn't be about if he committed the murders or not. It would be about why he did it and how everyone, including his relatives, could come to terms with it all. 
The local community struggled with the fact that Nick had killed his whole family, but now he had also ruined his entire life at such a young age. On February 9th, 2008, Nick spent his 16th birthday behind bars on the same day of his family's funeral, which 1,300 people showed up to pay their respects to the Browning family. Four wooden boxes filled with the Browning family members' ashes were brought into the church, and two dozen Boy Scouts from Troop 328 followed behind. Several speakers took the podium, and a colleague talked about John's sense of humor and his dedication to the law firm. A family friend described Tamara's commitment to the PTA at Cockeysville Middle School, where the two younger brothers went. Friends of John and Tamara's during their days at James Madison University described how they were made for each other, and photos from the 80s showed how in love they were as they would have celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary later that year. A friend mentioned how he could completely be himself around his good friend Gregory Browning, and a friend of Benjamin Browning said they used to call him TiVo, since he could quote so many different shows. Nick was shown in some of the family photos, but none of the friends and family mentioned him by name. Some vaguely mentioned that they loved the whole family. The final speaker, Reverend Bill Brown of Epworth United Methodist, the family's church, was the only one to mention Nick. Bill told the family sitting in the pews that he had decided to forgive Nick. He felt he had to if he was going to practice what he preached, and he asked them all to do the same. In a statement the family gave after the funeral, they said that their concern and love went out to Nick. They also said, whatever else lies ahead, he is a member of our family and he will have our support. And surprisingly, after everything, they really did support him. His paternal grandmother asked a police lieutenant to pass on a message to Nick while he was being held. She said that he would stand by him. His maternal grandfather also said that he still loved his grandson. Everyone's biggest question was, why would Nick do something like this? Some of the local media outlets tried to portray Nick as a good kid. Some claimed he had never shown signs of mental illness, and on paper, he was an honor student, he had a group of good friends, and was involved in sports. His attorney also said he had never been in trouble with the law before. Some believed that the only explanation was that Nick had been driven to commit these murders by a demon. The community was desperate to understand how something like this could have happened. And after his court hearings began, Nick's grandparents and several aunts and uncles wrote letters to the court asking for Nick to be given leniency. His grandfather also wrote, quote, I have no doubt that Nick was mentally and physically abused for most of his life and that Tammy chose to become an enabler during the last few years of her life. As investigators dug deeper into Nick's personal background, they questioned as many friends and extended family members as possible. Most couldn't give them answers as to why or how Nick could have done something like this. Some said that his dad was too hard on him. Others said he lived a completely normal teenage life. Many teenagers have typical run-ins with their families. I know I did, and so many others do. So Nick's family experience really doesn't seem that odd to me. Other friends mentioned that Nick had obsessed over his dad's money and his inheritance, which he also, uh, he mentions to his friends right yeah it was heard on the school bus and i think in the locker room or something like that so he was well aware that there was money which also adds to premeditation motive, yeah. and motive another student who rode the same bus as nick overheard him talking about how his dad's will would be divided between nick and his two brothers evenly on the bus and in the school locker room nick had been overheard saying i would kill my father for the money which right there is potentially a motive for killing his brothers. Yeah, exactly. Money. That is wild to say, though. I mean, I understand dark humor and stuff, too, and friends, they probably just laugh it off. Like, my dad's got a lot of money. I would, you know, kill, kill him, him and take it. it. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I could see how that, you could just be saying that as a weird joke, but I don't know. Two or three weeks before the murders, Nick brought up his father's money again. Nick told a friend that he'd asked his father what would happen with the money if his two brothers were dead. John told him that the next closest relative would get the money, but no one on the bus or in the locker room ever took Nick seriously. His classmates even called him the joking type. But some of his classmates' parents could see that there was tension between Nick and his father before the murders. Nick was well on his way to making Eagle Scout, and at one of the recent meetings, he had just gotten a new handkerchief to show he had reached the next rank toward Eagle. According to one of the other dads, Nick ended up burning the handkerchief. His dad had pressured him to make Eagle, even though Nick didn't care about it. And within the last year, Nick's behavior in the troop was making it harder for him to reach Eagle. According to Nick, he had been emotionally and physically abused by his father. But when and why did Nick think that murder was the answer to all of his problems? 
At a hearing in July 2008, a forensic psychiatrist was called forward by the defense. The hearing was to determine if Nick should be transferred to a juvenile court or be tried as an adult. The doctor told the court that he believed Nick was fantasizing about killing his parents when he was on his way home to steal the family car that night. Nick had told the doctor that he believed he could do whatever he wanted without restrictions, and the emotional and physical abuse from his parents escalated to the killings. The doctor also believed that at the time of the murders, Nick was in a trance-like state. He claimed that he could remember hearing the gunshots, but couldn't remember actually pulling the trigger. And he felt like he had floated up to the second floor before killing the rest of the family. After this info was released to the public, even more people considered the theory that Nick was driven by a demon that night. At the end of the hearing, the judge ruled that Nick would remain in adult court. A few days before Halloween 2008, another hearing was held. They expected an argument from the defense about not using Nick's recorded confession in the trial, but instead the hearing ended up with Nick taking a plea deal instead of fighting it out in court. The prosecutors originally wanted four life sentences without parole, but if Nick took the deal and pled guilty to four counts of first degree murder, he would get two life sentences with the possibility of parole. So he took the deal and the case never went to trial. By now they had pieced together the night of the murders down to the most gruesome details. And Baltimore County Prosecutor S. Ann Brops read them off one by one. As they went through the night of Nick's crimes, he began weeping. A sheriff's deputy then handed him a box of tissues. Up until now, Nick had shown little to no emotion during the hearings. On January 23, 2009, they held his sentencing hearing. And just before his sentencing, they played back his confession tape for the first time in court. It showed him eating his fast food meal for seven minutes before eventually confessing to his horrific crimes. Two days before the sentencing, he had joked about escaping prison during a jailhouse phone call to his friend Stephanie. He had said, quote, I hate justice. You need to break in here and break me out. Then he asked if she had heard about a convicted killer recently escaping from a Maryland prison, and he told her that would be him sometime next year. Again, this behavior opened up the big question. Was Nick just a cold-hearted murderer who plotted the killing, hoping to collect an inheritance, or was he an abused teen who acted out in the most tragic way possible? During the hearing, when he was given the option to make a statement, he spoke through sobs, telling his relatives, I'm so sorry. Then he said he was too overcome with emotion to speak, so he had his attorney read a statement for him. I won't read the whole statement, but just to summarize, he wrote things like, quote, I cannot make the pain go away. And things like, I never considered what effect my actions would have. I thought only of myself said my home life had become much more toxic to myself than I ever thought possible and he said he had been numbed after years of abuse. At the time of his sentencing Nick was only 16 so he was too young for the death penalty. His defense attorneys asked the judge to allow Nick to serve all of his life terms at the same time meaning he would be eligible for parole earlier but the prosecutors asked for consecutive life sentences so it'd be at least 23 years before he would have his first parole hearing. Regardless, parole for a life sentence in Maryland must be approved by the governor, which hasn't happened since 1994. The judge then sentenced Nick to two consecutive life sentences and two concurrent life sentences. He would be eligible for parole in 30 years. After this hearing, the public realized that not all of Nick's extended family supported him. John's sister Sally Browning wrote to the judge, did he actually think he was going to be charged as a juvenile and would walk away from his crimes? I will never understand why we are all living this hellish nightmare, but I pray for peace for all of us. We all got a life sentence. In a final statement, the judge said that he wasn't swayed by any of the explanations of Browning's motive. He also said the question of whether his actions were just diabolically evil is up to Almighty God. In 2014, when Nick was 21, his defense team tried to reduce his sentence. His attorney, Joshua Treem, argued that Nick wasn't getting the mental health services he needed because he had multiple life sentences. The state believed his original sentence was deserved and the judge ruled against the motion. After the hearing, it was reported that Nick said he would give his own life if he could take it all back. But many didn't believe him. The media pointed out that Nick had been using a controversial pen pal website called goodprisoner.com. He wasn't accessing the website himself, but he made a $30 account to send and receive letters through the website. His profile showed his zodiac sign, his sexual preference, his conviction, and his sentence. Next to his bio, where it asked how many siblings he had, he wrote none, which angered a lot of people. In the bio, he wrote things like, I have a long road ahead of me, 
and I would love to have someone to talk to through this fucked up journey of mine. All things considered, I think I'm still upbeat about life despite my bleak surroundings. I love to have fun, especially playing sports in the yard or joking around with my friends in here. Then he says, quote, whoever is reading this, reach out to me if you're interested. I'm open to anything or anyone. If nothing else, I have an interesting story to tell. Someone from my background doesn't generally end up in prison. I never expected in my worst nightmare to end up here in prison, but I tried to accept it and just live. Those are pretty bizarre statements, if right? you ask me. Someone from my background doesn't... That's, that's the one that jumps out to me, too. Doesn't generally end up in prison. Because he's affluent? Does he think that like yeah. rich people don't do strange things? Because I be the opposite or but. maybe he's referring to the fact that he's a kid he was a kid when oh, he came in. possibly i think he's pretty upset that he wasn't tried as a juvenile in this case which i'm glad he he wasn't because it probably would have led to a lesser sentence yeah and again i mean he was far more mature than a 15 year old it seemed like it, it seemed, at least it seems like it right? yeah over a decade after the murders, Nick's case was brought up several times when lawmakers introduced the Juvenile Restoration Act in Maryland. The act forbids juvenile offenders from being sentenced to life without parole, and it creates a process for juvenile offenders to seek reconsideration for prior sentences if they were convicted as an adult and spent at least 20 years in prison. The Maryland House of Delegates and the Senate approved the bill. Governor Larry Hogan vetoed it, though. But the Maryland General Assembly overrode his veto and the act was passed in April 2021. 415 people then became eligible for review. In the first year, 23 of these cases were granted immediate release. As for Nick, he had spent most of his time reading and writing while still incarcerated. He received the 2021 Media for a Just Society Award by a person who is incarcerated category. His essay, Little Gardens, was published by PEN America and received first place in the essay category of their prison writing contest. He's also earned a bachelor's degree and an MBA in 2022. He also has an active profile on writeaprisoner.com where inmates can find pen pals. But the horrific tragedy of the Browning family will never be forgotten. Nick is currently 31 years old and serving a sentence at Western Correctional Institution in Maryland, and he will be eligible for parole in his early 40s. Is that a fair punishment for him? I highly doubt he's... Paroled. I don't think he's going to get paroled. No. I uh, really don't. This whole case, though, is just a... It's just a trip. I don't... It's... I think one of the most punctual parts of this was the family saying that we'll still support him because I think maybe they're trying to find a silver lining and everything. They're like, look... We lost everybody else. Let's not lose... This whole family's gone... All we have left is Nick now, who has ruined the rest of his life. The best thing we can do in this scenario is just support him. And that's all we can do. I really struggle with how I feel about minors that commit murder and having them be released, which I think it's really a case by case basis, but. In this case, I just feel like, what does justice mean, right? Like, what is justice for the Browning family and, and those impacted by the loss of those, those people? If it were me, I think I would never want to see Nick outside of, of prison again. Yeah. Like he, he clearly planned this out and was mature enough to fall through with it so does he get a second chance at life that's a tough question when had he been a little bit older or even in a different state or location they would have locked him up and threw away the keys yeah in this type of scenario i know there's a big argument especially in juvenile cases because your brain isn't fully developed right. you know that's that's a big argument i'm at least happy that that act is approaching it as we'll just do a case-by-case -case scenario and we're reviewing these cases it's not just like look everyone's open to getting out it's i'm sure if we looked into the cases where those inmates did get released 
it's not a Nicholas Browning situation, right? Just well, and it's like, what family. is the quality of life for that individual? For Nick specifically, or I mean, any of them, but Nick specifically, like you are, this case is infamous at this point. And so everybody's going to know who you are. True. What, like, are you going, like, obviously he could go probably find somewhere where nobody knows him, but it's like, this is going to follow you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Even not even just have it, having the, the record, but obviously on your conscience. I don't know. He's, he's going to have to come to terms with that for the rest of his life as well. Yeah. And I know he's, he's said that he now feels remorse and he regrets this every day and wishes he could take it back. But it's like, you robbed your entire family of the rest of their lives. Yeah. So it's like, why should you get a chance to live out the rest of your life? Yeah. So you think even just the chance at parole, I, I don't, I mean, I would be shocked if he got I, I'm, parole, but you're just saying even just the chance at parole. I kind of agree with the there. prosecutors here. Like, I think he should have just gotten two life sentences, no parole. Yeah. Yeah. And, I don't necessarily he disagree forfeited with that. that when he did this yeah i kind of agree it's it's hard with juvenile cases though because i don't know i mean we're definitely not who we are when we're 15 but yeah something this horrific i i don't think yeah i just don't you probably just can't come back from something like this i just don't know that there is enough evidence there and despite what the psychiatrist said which it sounds i mean it could have been nick just manipulating him and lying to him about what he actually experienced or maybe it was a was what actually happened with him being in a trance like state and and all that like what was that what happened there yeah like, what's the explanation for that and that that's somewhere i really still have a question about this like what what was going on there and again i go back to like something you know similar somebody snapped earlier this year in the same house there's something very weird about that, and it's probably just a, a coincidence. But is there something more going on there? I don't know. Yeah, it is very weird. We also don't have any. We don't have any context on what was going on with this other individual either. Yeah, true. But even in the Nicholas Browning case, we don't. Since we just all the victims were the other people in the house. Yeah, we don't, true. We don't. There's just a lot of unanswered questions of what uh, what was really going on in that house. I don't think right. we'll ever really understand. And it sounds like even the extended family maybe some of them did have some sort of grasp on it but unfortunately yeah we'll just never be able to hear from no. from the victims you know no i i do believe that this was premeditated murder though i believe that he planned he set out to do this yeah and he he saw the opportunity and he took it and i'm more inclined to believe that i'm still i just i don't know this this whole case is just i have no I know, idea it's where a, it's at it's it's one of those that just will always leave you questioning things and wondering what ifs and and why wanting to know more yeah yeah, yeah. all these unanswered questions but, but with that being said we're gonna leave you there with 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 those questions why do you think nick did what he did do you think the punishment is just for his crimes and is there you know what do you think about this other other shooting that happened earlier this year with another mentally disturbed individual let us know your thoughts in the comments but i'm gonna end this episode here and leave you with a, a clip of the family being remembered at uh, nick's younger brother's middle school memorial service we'll see you next time more tears and maybe a little closure at a Baltimore County middle school where students remember two former classmates and their parents. It was a tragedy that rocked northern Baltimore County. Four members of the Browning family murdered in their Cockeysville home, allegedly by the couple's teenage son. But friends and classmates of the victims have found a way to help keep their memories alive. 11 News Education reporter Tim Tootin is live in the Update Center with that story. Tim. Well, Donna, students and staff members at Cockersville Middle School are still trying to make sense out of what happened to the members of the Browning family. Today, they dedicated a memorial garden to the family. Just one small gesture to try and help to ease the pain. Each of you will grieve in your own way. An entire school became one family in mourning. 
outside Cockeysville Middle. Ben. He came to school one August day, full of energy, spunk, and play. He liked his science in period one, gaining knowledge while having fun. With hair that... With hair that loved the Van de Graaff, with comments that would make you laugh. They tried to replace tears with memories. Well, they're just such great people and such a great family. You know, it's hard not to think of all the good things that happened with them. And they did just contributed so much to the school and community. We lost some quality individuals, but those of us who remain have a responsibility to ourselves and to our friends to never forget all that is good. When you think of the tragedy, you just have to think of the bright side of things. And the bright side for these students are garden, fresh flowers, new life, and a plaque to remember. Magnolia Altaflora, in loving memory of CMS students Greg and Ben Browning and their parents, Tammy and John Browning, taken from us February 2008. Gone, but not forgotten. At this time, I formally dedicate this memorial garden in their memory. This is your garden to sit, to reflect, to laugh, and to remember, and also create your own dreams and carry with you some of the words and thoughts you hear today. Tragedy was so great, like, you know, so large, and it was hard for everyone to take it in. So I feel when seeing the beauty of this garden, you know, they'll think of the the good memories and how great the family was.